got me. Wow, what a what an amazing performance the praise team did today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm around music a lot, so it's easy for me to to kind of take for granted some of the the musicians and some of the talent God's put in this church, music-wise, and I, I really appreciate it today. I tell you guys put a lot of hard work into it, but I saw the Spirit interacting with a lot of people. I really appreciate that. So just praise God for that. <clears throat> You know, we have quite a bit to cover today. I have to do uh, two and a half chapters, and it just kind of worked out that way. Next week, uh, Mark and Angie Gwynn, with uh, their sons, uh, Cedar and Archer, will be here, who are missionaries who serve this church in the United Kingdom. It's always enjoyable and amazing to hear people talk about what God's doing in an area where you are not living, what the Spirit is doing in an area where you have never been to, Mark is such a spirit-driven individual, and I know Angie is as well, but I really appreciate his ministry and the things that he's been doing and the, the doors that they've been walking through that God has opened up. So I, I encourage you all to come next week. Um, it will be very interesting, and, and you'll get to see the spirit move. And that's one of the, the things I love to do. I love to see the spirit move. I just had a, the pastor from Indy Alliance, Adam, just texted me in uh, I just got this text and it said, hey, God loves you even if you look like a hippie. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, yeah, isn't that amazing? We, we do serve a faithful God. And he said, yeah, he blows my mind every day. And that's really going to be the therm, therm, the theme of my sermon today. Every day. I'm going to highlight some things that these two and a half chapters, Acts 16 through 18, of Paul's ministry, of what God was doing with Paul. And it wasn't something that was topical. It wasn't something that was on the Sabbath only or on Sunday morning only. It was every day. And I'm going to basically really not give you a sermon today. I'm going to give you um, an account or two, and then I'm going to give you a charge. But we do, we do worship a faithful God. We do serve a faithful God, and, and sometimes He's so faithful, it's easy to look past, look past that and, and sidestep a lot of the things He's doing in our lives. And I think Paul's life gives, up, gives us an illustration. It sets up an illustration for somebody who that was a sinner, a sinner like me that had an encounter with his Savior. But there's more to it than that. So before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, I stand before you this morning. Now, Father, we praise your name. The reality that I can live in a relationship with you, Father, is, is overwhelming at times. But the reality of it and the truth of it, through your love, comforts me. Yeah, Father, I know you're doing a lot of things. I know you're probably doing over ten things in my life right now, and I'm probably recognizing three. And Father, I just, I just want to praise your name today. I want... Your words to come through, I want this glory for you. Not for me. Not for what I can do. And not how well I can speak, Father, but for your holy name. Amen. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you an account of Paul's ministry. <clears throat> And why the mindset on the flesh is death, and the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. See, Paul's life sets up an illustration. It gives an example. Not that we are all called to be Paul's, but it gives an insight to the relationship he had with his king. The relationship he had with his father. 
I want you to look at Paul the Jew as well as Paul the Christian and Paul's failures and Paul's sins but his desire for the Spirit and the obedience that came along with that. The encouragement of what Christ did, it, did in his election. I do say election because Paul is a prime example of election we find in the New Testament. Most people, we get fr afraid, we get kind of scurried off when we hear words like predestined and election. But Paul is absolutely an example of election in the New Testament. This election is God coming and calling him out and setting him aside. God calling and coming and, and setting him aside for his own purposes. That Paul's going to learn, that Paul's going to understand, that Paul's going to wrestle with, sometimes grapple with, ultimately lose his life. But that election that was given to Paul for reasons maybe not known to him, I'm sure he knows now because I know he is up there with him. But at the time when he showed up, this stranger in this bright light before him who he thought he knew, he realized he really had no idea who he was at all. He realized he was not following him at all. He was not close with him. So if you'll jump back to Acts 9 in Paul's conversion on that road to Damascus. The road comes down into Damascus almost like a, a very slight decline. And as Paul was coming in, he had that murderous intent. If you recall, Stephen had just been murdered. The first Christian martyr had just died. And it was something that Paul condoned. It was something that Paul supported. It was something that Paul agreed with. And he was going in to find more believers. He had this murderous intent. But he had an encounter with the one who calls. Not just an encounter with his calling. You see, when I focus solely on my calling, it can actually become a stumbling block. It, it can become a stumbling block and it can distract me and it can allow for my character to become untethered to my calling. When I focus solely on, hey, I'm called to be a pastor, or, hey, I'm called to be an evangelist, hey, I'm called to be a healer, all these things, whatever it may be, and I focus solely on that and I don't necessarily bask in that relationship and spend time with the Father and seek the face of the Lord, some of those lines start to get distorted. Some of those lines start to blur and it's easy to keep going forward in the sense of what Paul was doing. She had this white light flash and this question was asked. It was, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Which showcases the closeness of Jesus Christ to his children. Jesus Christ to his followers. When the church is persecuted, Jesus is persecuted. When you persecute his sons and his daughters, you are persecuting him. Paul didn't know this, though, because Paul didn't know Jesus. But Paul was doing this because this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to stop this blasphemy. I'm supposed to stop this spread of idolatry about this Jesus character. I'm supposed to stamp out any window that could give a spread for who this Jesus is character is because this is not of God this is of the evil one and this is what I can do for God but Jesus revealed to him no I am the one you're persecuting and after you get up off of your face I'm going to tell you what you're going to do and you're going to go in the city and you're going to wait for me and I'm going to give you further instructions so now the one who didn't necessarily believe is taking orders from the king. And because he had an encounter with him, not just his calling, it shaped, it affected, it changed Paul's life because it was an intimate experience. It was so intimate, he could sing songs of praise while shackled and bruised and beaten in a Philippian prison. He could cry out to God when he was under the most intense amount of suffering when he was bruised, when he was broken, when he was depressed, when he was happy, when he was hungry. He could praise God's name. And that is an intimate relationship. He could look past his own desires, his own wants, his own needs. 
and rather look at the kingdom of God. In my life, I, I often think about what I want first. I often think about what will enable me to do ministry. And it's awfully rooted in a selfish way. And I think of Paul. And Paul's relationship with his father was something that was very selfless. It was something, because it was intimate, because he walked it with his father in that grace given to him by Jesus Christ, it was not something that was temporary. It was not something that was on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or while he was in the face of the public or while he was in a synagogue. But it was when eyes weren't around. It was when he was in a cell and non-believing, unbelieving prisoners could hear him. Unbelieving jailers could hear him. It was when he was before the public, when he was behind closed doors in every aspect of his life. And that is because he lived intentionally. Paul lived intentionally. One will lose the drive, the ability to live intentionally if you do not live with Jesus Christ. We are called to be entangled with Jesus Christ every day. We are called to have a confrontation with who Jesus Christ is every day. In my case, it's every second. It's every second because if I go longer than a couple seconds, I start trailing off. I'm easily distracted. I'm easily broken. We're called to have a confrontation with Jesus in all aspects of our life. In times of famine, in times of abundance. Because my heart wants Jesus, but my flesh still wants to go back to my sin. My flesh still wants to go back because that's what's comfortable. But because Jesus is in my heart, there's a confrontation with that. Because he has shown me what is right and what is wrong. And what used to feel right now feels foreign and alien. It doesn't feel acceptable. It doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't give me that warm, fuzzy feeling. It brings on feelings of, of utter dependence for Christ. How much I truly need Christ. I think of Eldon Morehouse. He's 81 years old. I bet Eldon would tell you today that he needs Christ more than ever. He needs Christ more now than he did when he was 30 years old. Words from the man himself. But he would say that because through his relationship with Christ, the Spirit has revealed to him how much he actually needs Jesus. It's not to some point in his life where, hey, I've got this. I can put this down now. I think I know the Bible. I've read the Bible. Because the Bible is not an owner's manual. An owner's manual will become obsolete. An owner's manual is not a living word document. An owner's manual will not transcend cultures, will not transcend boundaries set up by the enemy, set up by the adversary, and see broken people restored. In Paul's ministry, he would do a couple things. One, he would go into a synagogue or he would go to a public place like an open-air market. And he would go into a synagogue and he would spend time and he would start to teach and expound on the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jews. And then after he did that, he would go into an open-air market, a public place, place where people would gather, commerce was going on, whether he was by himself or if he was with other brothers and sisters. And he would start to teach out loud and expound on who Jesus Christ is. He would go and talk. He would go into areas where he knew people would be. He would go into areas where he knew people did not know Jesus Christ. Into areas where he knew there would be a confrontation. Not because Paul loved confrontation, but because, because Paul loved Jesus Christ. And in that love for Christ, it wasn't something that led to idolatry or legalism. 
but it led to freedom. Freedom to have an existence with your Redeemer. There's authority in that. There's authority that you've been given that I've been given. And I want you to, I want you to ponder that this week. I want you to wrestle with that. That undeniable urge to seek the face of the Lord when Jesus is in your heart. That thirst that's always there that's never quite fully quenched. That desire that, Jesus, I, I don't need you in a little part of my life. I want you in all parts of my life. I need you in all parts of my life. I don't want to show up just on Sunday morning. I don't want you to show up just before I eat when I pray. But I want you in all aspects of my life, whether it's my marriage or it's my relationship, how I treat my sons or daughters, how I view you, how I view the love that you've given me. You see, when Paul preached, three reactions always happened. Rejection. That no, I don't believe, I don't want to know, your God's dead, or your God never existed. Two, indifference. That maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God, I don't know. We'll see what happens. You know, we'll kind of like throw it up in the air, see where we fall. Three, there is the acceptance and the surrender through the Spirit. The acceptance and the surrender through the Spirit. And where Paul went, many things accompanied him. Many things usually characterized his presence, and they weren't always fun, happy, warm things. There were things like riots, social upheavals, beatings, stonings, floggings, murder, incarcerations, being called in before a council, being put on trial, having his associates, his brothers and sisters attacked for associating with Paul, being told to, to stop teaching about this Jesus character and to move on, to leave the city at once, and having to flee by night because of murderous intents, murderous plots to take him out because of his allegiance to his Redeemer, to his Savior. But Paul kept fighting the good fight. Paul's steps kept being directed by grace. So Paul kept going forward. Because of his encounter with Jesus, he was no longer of the world, even though he was in the world and would suffer greatly at the hands of the world. Just like, just like God told Ananias, he's going to learn how much he's going to suffer from my name. I don't think Paul... I think his mind was so blown at that time that it was so confused that he just saw Jesus Christ in front of him. This person that he thought didn't exist. This person that he thought was a fool. I think he had so many things going through his mind that he couldn't even have begun to grasp suffering. He was having trouble seeing. And usually when you can't see visibly, some of your other senses start to get sharpened. I bet it would be safe to say that Paul started listening a bit more closely that night. Not just to his calling, because that's not where it starts and that's not where it ends. It starts with Jesus and it ends with Jesus, because it's all about Jesus. Just like Paul said, if, if I live as Jesus and I die as Jesus, it's all about Jesus and it doesn't matter. I don't know how many times I've been asked, what are you going to do if you die and this is all a myth? Well, my faith tells me it's not, but... My relationship with Jesus is what matters. My relationship with Jesus is what covers me. Because of His grace. Rooted in love. I cannot give you a more pure, true example of love. Than what Christ has shown to the church. What Christ has done to the church. Because He has justified us by grace. By the work on the cross. Delivered after the resurrection. Giving us salvation. Saving us from the death of sin. So we can live with Him. So we can be with Him. That's why it's not just a little part of your life. Because He took it all. He paid the ultimate price. He wants your heart. 
And he's there. It's baffling sometimes. I go out and I, I see people and we continue to walk. We just continue to walk past Christ. And I do it myself. This is not something that I see other people. I do it myself. I step into the flesh willingly and knowingly. Oh, I'm getting ready to get mad. So I'm going to step into the flesh and then I'm going to justify it. And then ultimately I'm going to fall back and go, well, God's love. And God's mercy, so it's okay. So it's okay. And that's what justifies that relationship and that existence. Intimacy with the Father was at the forefront. Not some elaborate intellectual exercise that proposes theological constructs. Or some social movement that is rooted in an agnostic approach to humanity. Or a personal agenda that is a glutton for the ego but starves the spirit but a relationship to live, to be in his existence, to operate in that grace. You see, we've been lied to. All of us have willingly drank that Kool-Aid. We've opened up our mouths. We've let that poison seep in. We've let it resonate. That Christianity is something that ultimately should take me to places of great comfort. That Christianity is about me. It's about how I feel. It's about what I get out of my Sunday morning experience. What I get out of the music. Whether I like the kind of music that's played. And if I don't like the kind of music that, that's played, then it's not a good praise music. And then I want something else. Because ultimately it comes down to how I feel and how it makes me feel. And it's about me. It's not about that relationship with Christ. It's not about falling in it and adhering to what He has done. But it's more about what puts God in my pocket and gives me, gives me my get out of hell free card. Now my get out of hell free card, hell is absolutely real. Hell is absolutely a place that people do go to. I'm not dismissing that. But when you view hell only, you look past Jesus. Because hell is for the adversary, as John says. And we're children of God. And he has called us out of that. And when you focus solely on things like hell and damnation and hellfire and sin, you miss out on the grace of Christ. You miss out on who Christ really is. I don't think about hell much. I don't think about damnation much. When I pray, I don't go, God, please don't send me to hell. Because I know I'm not going there. Because Jesus has shown up in my life now. Now, not after I die, but now. When he comes into your heart, it starts now. It doesn't end. Because he is outside of time. And we will have eternity to praise His holy name. We will be shoulder to shoulder, side by side. I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying. I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying. Comfort is a, is a great thing. Liking something on Sunday morning is a great thing. Whether it's the speaker or the music or the people. Comfort is something from God. God comforts those who mourn. You don't have to live in utter poverty or misery to know God. I don't see that in, in the Gospels. I don't see that in the book of Genesis. But it's comfort in what and to what cost. Comfort in the flesh. Comfort in idols. Comfort in things of the world. Things that ultimately choke out the seeds of faith and quench the spirit. Or comfort in the intimacy with my Savior, with my risen King. The intimacy that enables and allows for intentional living that Paul had. I love how Paul always seemed to push through in his evangelism the relationship rather than the retreat. The relationship was what pushed him forward. 
led by the Spirit, but ultimately it was what pushed him forward. In Paul's evangelism, he viewed in the hope of the lens of righteousness. Paul absolutely had a burden for those who did not know Jesus. He took on some form of responsibility for their lostness. It was not, hey, I'm safe. Sorry, you're going to hell. It was, hey, I had an encounter. My father showed up, and you know what? It's not just for me. It's for you too. And you're lost. And I'm not okay with that. And I'm going to tell you about it. And whether that takes away all my credibility, takes away all my respect, makes you look at me weird, makes you hate me, makes you kill me, it doesn't matter because it's all about Jesus. And I'm going to live as Jesus and I'm going to die as Jesus because that is all that matters. Those are, th those are heavy words. I mean, I can say those and not live them. And that's what I do a majority of the time. My lips say something and my flesh does something else. And that is where the intimacy with the Father you are going to see. Where are you at? It sounds a lot today like I'm saying, you know, if you just do this and you do this and you put in these variables and this problematic equation, then you'll get to salvation. And this is how you have a relationship with Christ. Try to stay with me on what I'm saying because it's not what you do. It's what's been done for you. And your eyes have been opened. And your hearts have been softened. And you have seen this. You have already experienced this. Not all our conversions were like Paul's. Not all, all our ministries are like Paul's. My ministry is almost entirely opposite of Paul's in a, a majority of the areas. My conversion was not like Paul. I didn't see a bright light. I felt a bright light in my heart, but I didn't see one. I don't go from place to place like Paul did. I might go on tour, but it's nothing like Paul did. I come back and I sleep in my bed after a few weeks. I come back and I get to be with my wife and I get to hang out with my daughter. But that's not what defines me and that's not what defined Paul. Evangelism was not exactly what defined Paul. Who defined Paul was Jesus Christ. And that is who defines you. The world no longer holds your name or defines who you are. But only Jesus Christ can do that. And nothing and no one can take that away. Because of his love, his grace, and his mercy. You know, in Paul's ministry, his allegiance to Jesus Christ was essential. It was imperative. It was in all aspects. And I believe if, if you could look at the body of, of Paul and see the scars all over his body from the beatings and from the floggings, from the stonings, it would be a little bit clearer. It would be a little bit more understanding why it was so important to Paul. Why it was not something of just a, a, a personal agenda or a social movement or something like a genre of music. Why it was more important that the lost knew Jesus Christ. That the lost could live with Jesus Christ, which was a reality. That speaks measures for a group of Gentiles like us. In Paul's ministry, it put him in front of people and places that were foreign. Put in front of the Areopagus in, in Athens. The Areopagus, a, a council of Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. I remember when I was an intern a few years back here, this was Mars Hill. It seemed like there was churches popping up everywhere called Mars Hill. And Rob Bell was really popular at the time. And... Mark Driscoll's church was blown up in Seattle, which was called Mars Hill. And it was this huge debate. It was this huge debate that Mars Hill was an example of a great failure on Paul's part. It was a great failure on Paul's part because he went before these philosophers and he basically synchronized his message. 
I always disagreed with that. I've heard that in this church. I disagree with that. I think when you start looking at evangelism in terms of winning and losing, it is dangerous. Because when you start looking at evangelism as winning and losing, it will ultimately come back to selfishness. It might feed your ego, but it will not produce selflessness. And what matters is the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached to a group of unbelievers. That's what mattered. That's what counted. The Holy Spirit will do what the Holy Spirit will do. In my experience, the Holy Spirit has never been wrong. The Holy Spirit has always shown up. The Holy Spirit has always gone before me. Even times of, of une uneasiness, times of great testing, and times in the wilderness. I spent a, nine months in the wilderness one time, and it was a terrible place to be, and I hated it. While I was there, I didn't feel like praying. I didn't feel like opening up the Word. I didn't feel like I knew God anymore. I kind of felt like maybe uh, this whole thing is kind of starting to fizzle out. Maybe this whole Christian tag, this Christian experience really is this this kind of mythical, fairy tale mindset. And in that, quite the opposite. This intimate relationship was birthed, and the Spirit showed up, and it confronted me. I had a confrontation, and it's those kind of confrontations where you cry and you pray out to God. And it's almost like you're yelling at God, but it's, you're not yelling at God, but you're yelling to Him. Because you're hurting, because you're suffering, because you want to know Him, because He's revealed something to you. He has shown who He is. And it's something that you just don't want a little bit of. You want more and more. You want to live there. You want to continue to walk in that. Usually... I end with asking a question. So my question today is why? It's a pretty open-ended question. Why? Who cares? Why do I believe in Jesus? Why should I live intentionally? Why did Paul evangelize? Why did all the apostles suffer a martyr's death. What's the point? So I want to call you today, everyone in this room, to some measure of responsibility to the ownership of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ has given you that authority. It's not something that you can do. It's something that's been given. So there is authority in that. And this is not something I'm saying, like I said before, where if you walk this way and you do this thing, and this is what will bring you closer to God. And here are the 31, promise, the 31 promises God wants to speak into your life. No, 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 no. Omit that garbage. This is something that has been laid before you. Something that was risen from the tomb. And He gave you authority in that. I encourage you to pray for discernment in that in prayer this week. When you're in your home groups or you're with your spouse or your co-workers or your roommates, to pray about that. Pray for better understanding in that authority. Because in that authority, you're going to see some things of what the Spirit is doing. And many times, we often think we know what God's doing. We often think we know what God is saying and why. And many times we're wrong. That's why I've always viewed evangelism as the end result doesn't necessarily matter because the end result is up to the Spirit. And I'm not saying that some people are destined to hell. I do not believe that. We all have the opportunity to hear. I believe that Christ died for all. I don't believe in this universalist approach that all will go and enter into His joy because He died for the world. But I believe that He died for His sons and daughters. And those are who hear the call. In Luke 8, 22, 21 and 22, it's, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. 
The NIV says, those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. And in that, there is authority. So you are responsible. I want to remind you of your responsibility. Because we have been shown and given grace freely. We have to operate in that. We have to extend that. I was convicted this week. I, uh, I got a letter from a friend of mine. Um, a, a really close friend that I, I grew up with. Entered a re rehab program several months back. And, and uh, he's learning how to live life chemically free and uh, he's been in there for four or five months and I'll get emails and calls from people and say hey he, he really wants you to write him a letter he, he really he's really doing he's doing rough you know he really he's asking about you he wants you to write him a letter so I'd sit down and I'd start writing him a letter and I, I'd make it two or three sentences into the letter and I'd just get angry and upset and I would just stop because for those of you who have been around practicing addicts, it's not fun. And it's gut-wrenching sometimes, and it's hurtful. And this guy, I mean, we, he hasn't been clean since we were 15, and he's 32 now, so I don't really know him before the drug addict, and he's hurt me. And I don't necessarily want to extend that grace. And then Friday morning, I walk into Nancy's office, and I check the mailbox, and and he wrote me a letter. And in that letter, he was encouraging me. And he was thanking me. And he was showing and talking about what God had been doing in, in his life. He said, great man, it's amazing that Jesus showed up. I don't have to stick needles into my body 15 times a day anymore. I don't have to fall asleep shaking anymore and wondering what tomorrow's going to bring. Because Jesus has shown up. And even though he's not in front of my face, I can, I can see sparks of life in his eyes. But I felt convicted because I didn't want to extend that grace to him. Even though that grace was fully extended to me. Even though in that grace is where I live. Every blink of the eye, every word that comes out of my mouth, that is where I live. But that flesh still wanted to, to, take, to take back, to keep score. Not like what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. God doesn't keep score. God, God doesn't keep track of your transgressions. He's destroyed that through His Son. But I was still doing that and I felt convicted. So I started writing him a letter again, and I made it all the way through this time, but that grace that was shown to me, that grace that was shown to Paul, even though many would look at Paul and say, that's really not grace. That really looks like a heavy burden to call, to, to carry, to adhere to that call. And many would look at Paul and say, man, I'm glad I'm not called to do that. I'm one of them. I'm glad that God hasn't put me in areas. But there's grace in that. Paul walked in that authority, in that grace. So this week, while you're questioning if God's there, while you're questioning what Jesus is doing, I just want you to ask why. Why do you believe in Jesus? Why do we evangelize? Is evangelism not the gift of God? It's pretty clear to me, but sometimes it gets distorted. Now as the praise team comes up, I'll pray. Dear Father, just thank you for being able to come together under your name, in your grace.
spend time with you, Father. Even through our struggles and, and our testing, Father, and our transgressions, you continually, continually show up. You're continually there. Even while I was still dead, Father, you showed up. You called just a sinner like me from a small, no-name town out of all his bondage. And I thank you for that, Father. And Father, as we, we go out this week, and a lot of us are going to go into areas of life that we don't necessarily like, our jobs or some of our relationships, Father, I ask you to go before us in that. I ask you to continue to carry and provide for us. Father, if we are not living in an intimate relationship with you, I really don't want to live. And Father, I praise your holy name. I thank you, Father. I love you so much, my Father, my sweet Lord. In your Son's name, amen. Shams 
ever home to me. All I am and have and ever hope to Thank you. You're a blessing in my life. I appreciate you. If there's anybody new here or anybody that doesn't feel connected, come up and talk to me. I just want to have an opportunity to meet you. But I, play, I pray blessings on you all as you walk out in the world this week. Thank you very much.